my name is Crispina French and promoting creative textile reuse is my jam. I am an OG textile alchemist, worked my way through art school making ragamuffins from thrift store sweaters way back in the 1980s. That college side hustle grew into a full-fledged business and here I am today to show you how to do it too. Stick around for all the things helping to navigate both the chaotic and dreamy chapters of building your profitable textile upcycling business. We'll talk material sourcing, business savvy, product development, marketing, and self-care. Gloss over the hard parts? Not here. Experience, lessons, and know-how. Deep dive into the struggles, wins, and rewards of running your sustainable textile upcycling business. Think of this as your favorite craft class mixed with environmental business school. Are you ready to be inspired, energized, and supported? This is the Rags to Riches Textile Upcycling Podcast. Are you a textile-centric crafter who loves vintage yardage, unusual fabrics, notions, and sewing tools and tutorials? Maybe you are a sewing teacher in need of cool and inexpensive cloth for students. Whether sewing high-end bespoke couture or experimenting with new textile making processes, SwansonsFabrics.com, located in the heart of Turner Spalls, Massachusetts, has just what you need. You can shop online or at the very well-organized and jam-packed store. Swanson's Fabrics is a thrift shop of fabric, notions, and textile tools. It's a community repurposing the leftover collections of home sewers, addressing the reality that we have enough fabric and craft supplies for generations stored right in our very own attics and closets. Swanson's makes it very easy to pass on an excessive fabric stash and find inspirational treasure for sewing projects. Additionally, Catherine Swanson hosts an online group for entrepreneurs interested in using her business model for fabric thrift stores in their communities. Find Swanson Fabrics at swansonfabrics.com and on TikTok and Instagram. Hello, Rags to Riches Textile Upcycling Podcast listeners. I am so excited today. I have a guest named Deborah Rappaport, and you might have seen her around and about. Her vibe, her visual is very notable. I had the pleasure of running across Deborah in my um, orbit on this planet <laughs> years ago. And I finally had this beautiful opportunity to get to know Deborah a little better, learn more about her passion, what drives her, and her ties to reusing and upcycling materials. So, Deborah is a visual artist. In an undisputed fashion icon from New York City, and she loves to work with and also wear non-traditional and repurposed materials. So, Deborah, welcome. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure to be here today. Oh, you're welcome. So, tell me a little bit about like how. What is your? Uh, how did you get here from there? Like, how did you? How did we? How did you find your way? to being the person, not only are you this fashion icon, but you've also been featured in TV shows and movies, and you are really such a beautiful inspiration and role model for women um, in the, like, you know, after most of us feel fashionable, there's this period of time where, you know, our, our cult culturally, we're kind of taught like, oh, well, you're kind of past, right? You're past your prime. Well, no, I'm still working up to my prime and I know that you are too. So share a little bit about your path and how, mm. how that's unfolded. Well, I had a very creative, innovative mother and a sister who's two and a half years older. And we loved playing dress up all the time. And it wasn't considered frivolous. And my mother encouraged it with lots of yardage and old hats and things. And we'd put on music and we would dance dressed up and change costumes. And um, from that, and it wasn't even about shopping or being trendy. It was more about just being creative. So the act of creation is really, you know, from your soul and from your spirit. It has nothing to do with what the fashion magazines tell you. In fact, Lagerfeld says after trendy is, oh God, I forgot. After trendy is tacky. And 
who wants to be trendy? To be trendy, then I'm going to look like everybody else. So it really is just finding your own creation and what works for you. And um, I, as I said, my mother was a maverick and we grew up in New York and then we moved to New Jersey and we looked so out of place because the, all the kids, they were wearing bobby socks and saddle shoes and we were wearing black tights and Italian ghillie shoes and they didn't know what to make of us. And we didn't care. They didn't bully us. They were just totally intrigued. So right, right. it was How encouraged. Fun. How fun. And so, so this, this is a lifelong thing for you. This is not totally. something that you've devised over the last part of your life. This is something you've just grown into and yeah. expressed yourself visually in the way that you do with your presentation of person. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Cool. It's what I, it's what I do best. Cause it's like my morning meditation. I, I get quiet and I check in with who am I? And then what do I feel like putting on my body to make my sculpture. It's about me. It's not about what the rest of the world has to say. You know, what's the weather? What are my activities? And who am I today? My inner knowing. That is beautiful. The inner knowing, right? Like now Mm -hmm. in our culture, I feel like women are finally coming into a place where that's something that we need to, that is kind of promoted to focus on, right? Like self-care, inner knowing, being um, like in touch with your inside and your feelings of how you're going to walk in the world today. Right. Right. And, you know, and I think color is so important because color is a vibration. And, you know, if you know anything about the chakras, each chakra is a color And we are a vibration. We are a frequency. So I cannot wear black because it doesn't work for me. It it deadens my soul. So I eat with color. I dress with color. And that's what I encourage others to do. At least experiment with it and see how you feel. That's awesome. So, you know, you're, you're a quite renowned artist in your own right. And I would like to learn a little bit more about how that came to be part of what you do and what mm-hmm. your medium is and how, how does, how does that all fit in? Okay. Well, I went to undergraduate school at Carnegie Mellon and studied design. And then a lot of that was textiles, weaving and printing. And then I went on to graduate school at UC Berkeley and that totally changed my life because up till then education to me was like intimidation you're not good enough. You're not this. You didn't go to that school, blah, blah, blah. And when I got to graduate school, it was like everything I did, my professor said, yes. And, and you know, what's next? What can we add? And I was encouraged that who I was was good enough. And as soon as I graduated, he recommended that I teach at UC Davis. And at 25, I got a job at Davis and I stayed till I was 35. And I was tenured and everything. And I love teaching. I just couldn't deal with academia and all the administrative baloney. So I retired at 35 and came back to New York. And of course, everybody thought I had lost my mind. But I continued to make um, what I called fibrous raiments, which are textile sculptures for the body. I didn't call them costumes. I didn't call them apparel. And they were exhibited all over the world, starting with Lausanne, Switzerland, with the Tapestry Biennale. And then I was in New York temporarily doing the transition, and I started making neck pieces out of found metal because it was lots of patinaed, run-over metal from the cars in the street. And I started building embellishments like that. And then once I moved back to New York, I continued with fiber and cloth and paper and, and always did... Well, I did a lot of wall pieces and other things, and I've always done hats and I've always done embellishments for the body and because I wanted to wear them. So and I didn't like little doohickey, a little diamond or a little gold charm. That just was not me. It had to make a statement. And and that's that's what I love to do. I love to use my body as an armature to build sculpture upon. That is so cool. So I heard you mention that you like to build things out of, you know, patinaed metal from the street. And how did, how did that start? Was that something that you just kind of fell into as like, oh, finding cool textures and colors that you just wanted to build into? Or was that more of an environmental choice? Like, how did that come? Uh, into no, because that was back in the late 70s when I was transitioning to move to New York. And my mother always loved antiques. So we would always go antiquing. So I loved old things with patina. You know, again, like I didn't like shiny diamonds and silver. And uh, so just seeing these beautiful pieces, 
in the street. And I know this isn't visual, but this is one that I made recently because it's very hard to find like a large piece. And um, when I find them and, and my partner is has gotten trained and he's been finding pieces and everybody is looking for pieces for me. Of course, nuts and bolts are easy to find, but I can build with those too. So I was transitioning and I didn't have any materials with me. I was living at my sister's apartment. So I started finding the metal and a cousin of mine who was a carpenter said, well, if you use silicon caulking, that's how you can get them to stick together because they were not even and, and they weren't lined up. And so I needed something that would fill the spaces. And I don't know how many I made throughout the 80s and into the 90s, but they're all except one in museums and all gone now. So then I just started making them again recently. And some of them are going to be in a show next month. And I'm just having the best time trying to find whatever there is to find. So that's that's part of my search. That is so, so cool. So you make these beautiful like sculptures for the body and then they're out there in the world for people to see in the museum setting. Is that correct? Yeah. Yeah. Cool. In fact, two years ago, just before COVID, I had a very large one person show in Athens, Greece at the very famous Ilias La Luna's jewelry museum. And um, it filled an entire space and I shipped everything over in three suitcases they came to get. And then we came back just, the first of March as COVID was happening. So the show stayed up for two whole years. How lucky was I? That's amazing. Um, you know, there yeah. are silver linings to that whole thing, right? Yeah, like, exactly. How cool. And so yeah. you're that, that would have given you like exposure for a lot extended period of time to people who may or may not have been aware of you in the world prior. How cool. Right. Yeah. That is awesome. Awesome. And- awesome. And then we went out, we were there for three weeks and I taught two hat workshops while I was there. And I got to meet a lot of Greek artists and and other local people. And that was just, you know, magnificent. How lovely. So when you teach a workshop, are you, you, uh, do you have materials in mind or is that something that Mm -hmm. your students will bring along with them? Well, if, if I have a particular thing, like if we're doing hats, then I know that we need the Viva paper towels and I supply that in the glue. If we're doing things like bracelets and things, um, I ask people to either bring the cardboard toilet paper rolls and things that are close to them, like postcards or images or ribbons or yarn that they want to use. I supply other things to inspire them. So it's a combination of me bringing a lot of stuff. And of course I have so much stuff that the last two workshops I, I, brought shopping bags so everybody could take a ton of stuff home so I wouldn't have to bring it back to my studio because it's time to let go of a lot of stuff already. That's awesome. So wait, did you just say you get you need Viva paper towels for the hat workshops? Yeah, 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 yeah. That's what the hats are made from. Um, <laughs> and that happened about eight, nine years ago. There was a roll of Viva on the table that my partner had bought. And I touched it and I said, my God, this is so textile-like because it wasn't embossed and it wasn't papery. So I first twisted it and then I folded it and then I started working on them. And I I don't know, I must have over 50 hats that that I've made and have taught many workshops. Even during COVID, I did a few hat workshops on on Zoom. And it was, you know, people found their own paper towels because I couldn't get it to them, but it it all worked Yep. So the actual material that the hat is constructed from is paper towel? Yeah, yeah. And then, I have no idea. <laughs> yeah. And to make it stronger, I then spray paint them. So that makes it impervious mm-hmm. uh, inside and out. And then embellish whatever, either with some acrylic paint or, or whatever, just to add more color. And, um, and people say, well, can you wear it in the rain? And I say, would you wear a good felt hat or a good straw hat in the rain? I mean, if you got caught, it wouldn't melt, but you take it off and, and put it in a shopping bag, just like you would do with a straw hat or a felt hat to protect sure. it. Yeah. Sure. I love that. And one of the things that I love about what I do and with textile upcycling mm-hmm. is that it's so accessible, right? You yeah. can, I literally started my business with $20 and a good sharp pair of scissors and your work is all, I mean, first of all, let me just say, 
anybody who is not familiar with Deborah Rappaport's work needs to go to our show notes pages and see the images that she has provided us because you would never, I, w- I didn't know. I've looked at your work for years and I had no idea <laughs> that what you made was made out of paper towel and toilet paper rolls. Like, yeah. Amazing. How cool. And talk about yeah. accessible. Yeah. And other, and other, you know, found materials, whether it's the mesh bags from the produce, uh, what I'm wearing here is an old sweater that I got at a flea market, but I added knitted shoulder epaulets. And then I added industrial felt epaulettes to make it even more sculptural and some cotton batting just to create a neckline. And then at the bottom, there's also like a hem or a, or a flounce also made out of industrial. So it really stands up and salutes. It's not just a baggy old man sweater. And so that's what I like to do. You know, I don't sew from scratch, but I alter and I create forms out of clothing and materials that speak to me. That's amazing. I just I'm so like excited and also like intrigued by your process. I think that, um, you know, going back to that real accessibility piece of the work that we both do, it's Mm -hmm. something that is kind of unusual, right? Like if you think about like fashion and the sort of classic sense of, you know, yards of fabric and patterns and cutting and lots of scrap and a lot of like like skill and knowledge that's needed before you can even get started. Whereas what we do and what we share is like, you yeah. know, just start with what's in front of you. If you have a sweater that needs to be like jazzed up, let's try that. And it, yeah. I love that, you know, if you make a mistake, you can either just roll with it and continue on that path or start over. It's not expensive, right? Exactly. And it's a process of play. We're not doing brain surgery. So there's nothing dangerous about what we do. And I say, whatever I do is as low tech as you can get, you know, a few stitches, a few pasting, a a stapler, you know, whatever. And just and just experiment, you know, again, like if you do something to a sweater and you don't like it, you either unravel it or you cut it up and put new sleeves on it. And it's you're really making collages out of everything. I mean, life is one big collage, truly. I love that. Oh my gosh, that's the best quote I've heard in a really long time. The thing too, I'm thinking is so cool too, like the whole, um, like the freedom, like what I'm hearing is like, you know, I just heard the word staple when you're talking about clothing and like, mm-hmm. I mean, it's so people often say to me, well, I, I can't, you know, if I'm teaching a workshop, oh, I, I can't, I, I don't know how to sew. And okay. I, I tell, I've actually never taken a sewing class in my life. And uh-huh. I kind of feel like, you know, putting a staple where you need it to hold that hat just the way you want it or mm-hmm. having that the freedom to experiment with materials that are non-traditional and tools that are non-traditional is something that might be easier for those of us who haven't had that traditional, like, you know, five eighths of an inch seam allowance and, you know, those yeah. Yeah. straight and ah, blah, blah, which really limits people's ability to kind of move beyond that into this amazing wild world of magical creativity, right? Yeah, right. The unknown, the unknown. Um, I have I have a quote that I always say that where there's creativity, there are no rules. Where there are no rules, there is no fear. It's the rules like a five eighth of an inch or you have to put a zipper in this way. No, there are no rules. We're just putting things together. I have a a friend, Sheila Weinstein, who wrote a book, Moving to the Center of the Bed, after her husband passed away from Alzheimer's in many years. And she talks to a lot of groups and people will often raise their hand and say, but I'm not an artist. I'm not creative. I can't paint the Mona Lisa. And she would say, can you make a sandwich? If you can make a sandwich, that's a creative act because you're making the decisions. Nobody's going to tell you you're wrong. Nobody said you can't use yellow cheese or black bread or a tomato instead of let. It's your decision. And if you don't like it next time you do it differently, it's no, nothing, no harm done. That is awesome. And it's true. It's like, you know, I believe, and I, I would be willing to wager that you would agree that every human has the capacity to shine creatively. And some of us are blessed with parents who encourage it. Myself, as like you, had parents who just, you you know, the sky's the limit. Like yeah. there, there is no limit, right? Yeah. And, you know, some of us had, had um, 
you know, got kind of damped down in the process, right? Like, well, you know, I'm not sure how you're going to make a career out of that. I'm not sure if that, you know, going to art school is not the right thing where, so, you know, so many times I hear people say to me, oh, I just wish that I could have my own business or my, you know, create a, a, a path mm-hmm. where I'm in the, I'm the boss. I'm the one who can make those decisions. And I just encourage people out there listening to us today to, to know that it's an option. It's, a, right. it's, a, it's never right. too late. It's you're exactly where you're supposed mm-hmm. to be. There's no harm. There's no regret as, as yeah. and, and you have the opportunity to, to move into that place that you desire whenever it's right for you. Mm-hmm. Well, you may have to experiment and like the journey might be up and down, but it's going to be that way anyway. But you've got to tap into your truth. I mean, I have a mantra that I call the four T's. And the first one is truth. And we all know our truth, who we really are, but our culture pushes it so far down so that we don't see it. But if we tap into it, we know. So that's the truth. Then we have to go to trust. Because it's too easy to ridicule it, criticize it and say, no, that's not really who I am. And then we have to really be tolerant of it. And then we have to wrap the whole package in tenderness and put it in out there in the world and give everybody else the space to do their four T's. I love that, Deborah. That's beautiful. We're going to take a short break. And um, come right back. If you have just tuned in, I want to let you know that we're having a really lovely conversation with Deborah Rappaport today, and we will be right back in just a few minutes. Today's episode of Rags to Riches podcast is brought to you by the Stitcherhood Recycling Society, my online membership community for creative textile upcycling, recycling, and reuse entrepreneurs. Inspiration, shared experience, tutorials, business savvy, and connection to a whole posse of people who understand the passion and intricacies of running an environmentally kind creative textile upcycling biz. Daily posts, weekly stitch hours, book recommendations, group chats, member profiles, and strong connections is what you can expect when you join Stitcherhood. Head on over to stitcherhood.crispina.eco and sign up for a free seven-day trial to see if my Stitcherhood Recycling Society is a good fit for you and your textile upcycling business. All right, we're back here with Deborah Rappaport, our fashion icon and creative um, instigator, um, empowerer, um, enthusiast, uh, making amazing sculptural pieces, mainly for the body, right? You do make wall art as well, if I'm right. Yeah, yeah. I I, I stop because I'm running out of space. So, I'm, you know, I'm working body, body size. Yeah. Well, and I think that I've seen your work displayed on a wall that's intended to be worn as well. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So oh, yeah, it's yeah. kind of like dual purpose, right? Right, right. Awesome. One of my favorite other things is, um, as all grandmothers used to be, they were creative during the depression and the war, making things out of already existing things. And we'd always go to grandma's and pull out the button drawer and dump it on the living room floor to play. And grandpa would say, oi, oi, you're making a mess. And grandma would say, be quiet, they're being creative. And that runs through every cell in my body. You can't be creative without making a mess. You have to just open up and play and experiment. And it's you're not working from a formula. OK, if you're making a real garment and you're following a pattern, that's a that's a whole other thing. But even so, you can experiment. Right. And right. That's it. I totally, totally agree with you. And I feel like so many people um, are kind of coming into their own right now in the world around the textile upcycling in any, I mean, material upcycling is probably a better way to put it. And yeah. I, I remember back to um, when I first got started, it was in the 1980s. Mm-hmm. And I'm sure that you um, heard the same where people were just kind of perplexed. Like, I'm not sure that it, I can, like, they couldn't really wrap their heads around my material use choices uh-huh. and were concerned, right? Like, is it clean? Is it okay to put that stuffed toy with my baby? Um, okay. And now here we are celebrating this explosion in awareness, this create creative uptick in people's uh, comfort with, you know, dressing in an individual style and making things for themselves and for others. Mm-hmm. Um, if you could go back 
to mm-hmm. your young self? Is there mm-hmm. something that you would have shared with that person to let them know how things would unfold? Well, way back, we didn't even use the word sustainable or recycled. Um, and then, of course, in the 70s started wearable art and art to wear. And I was already doing this kind of stuff in the 60s, crocheting with videotape from the local television station and, you know, other found materials. So, um, I mean, you know, it just popped into my mind. So many people go to the beach and they collect seashells and they embellish things with seashells. And it's all in our environment. So let's embrace it. We don't have to look for anything new. We have to create, but we don't and we have to invent, but we don't have to struggle to try to be an individual or find something new. It's really all in our environment. And I think it's really time to embrace that. Yeah. 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 You know, I, I was, um, this summer I was down on Cape Cod and I was talking to some Mm -hmm. of the friends of mine and we were just kind of discussing, it was actually a pair of sandals that I, I had repaired and they were made by somebody who, you know, made them for my feet. And they're, they're like one of my favorite things that I wear. And, Uh um, my friend said to me, it's so cool to hear the story. Like it has such a story. And then I started thinking and like looking in and, and, and what am I, you know, Oh, everything that I wear has a story. Mm. Right? Like there's a story to all the pieces that I have yeah. collected. If it's from the thrift store or somebody yeah. made it for me, or, you know, I've created it from, you know, compiling other pieces or altering. And I feel like that is a distinguishing kind of element of, certainly what you do. And I think what a lot of our listeners are um, kind of working toward or maybe relishing um, the, the idea of having a wardrobe and clothing that has so much, it's, it's more than meaning. It actually carries a story. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, yeah, I, I think I have so many things that are 30, 40 years old and I don't, I mean, I haven't bought anything retail in probably 20 years. And I don't even go to thrift shops anymore because people send me things. The pants I have on today, a friend from Seattle just brought them to me and swap meets are fabulous because you never know what you're going to find. If you go to a department store, you know, there's going to be black suits and a blue blazer with the brass button and it's predictable. And so to go to a swap meet and you find something outrageous, it's like, yes, it's a treasure hunt. And that's what's exciting. And then you do have a story about it. You know, I bought it in Slovenia or I bought it in Athens for two two euros because, I mean, Athens is an incredible place to go thrifting. There are so many stores and everything is two euros. Can you get any better than that? No, no, (laughs) not in my opinion. I'm like, I'm going to Google up some tickets to Athens. (laughs) <laughs> that sounds so fun. It's um, I, I actually have kind of dreamt, you know, if I had a, another lifetime or 48 hour days of, you know, doing uh, a world tour based yeah. on the location of thrift stores. Yeah. And, I mean, yeah. wow. Glasgow. Glasgow has amazing oh. thrift stores. So if okay. you ever have the opportunity. <laughs> yep. Okay, yeah. well, that, I mean, that, that would make a great book or just a whole great uh, podcast or something, where to travel and go thrifting. Right. And again, I mean, this is one of my signature things. It's a Brillo pad made into a bracelet. And Remember, you you've know, got to send us pictures of these pieces because okay. honestly, for those people listening, you're probably driving or doing something that you can't like stop and, and look at these images. But Deborah's actually wearing this beautiful copper bracelet that is actually. A Brillo pan. Yeah. And they come like six for a dollar in the 99 cent store. And I happen to love copper. So this is and again, it's just in the environment. And you see it and you say, oh, my God, I relate to that. It talks to me. And that that's what I do when I walk down the street. Um, You know, I find things. Here's another thing again that a friend sent me hair curlers, these foam rubber hair curlers. And then I just started playing with them. And it's one of my most favorite necklaces. Yeah, it makes a statement. I love orange. You know, everything depends on the texture, the color, how to wear, where to wear. You know, it could also be a, a headband. And then um, this is another one I love. I, I made during COVID. I saw a similar piece that was from the Metropolitan Museum. It was a silver bodice from I don't know when. And I said, well, I can do that out of toilet paper rolls. So it's a bodice, but it's also a boa. 
And part of my philosophy is frame the face. If you got a $2,000 pair of shoes on and you walk into a party, nobody's going to notice them. But if you frame the face, either with a hat or some kind of large necklace, people are going to, your face is going to shine and people are going to see you. So I do a lot of workshops on boas, bibs, and breastplates, because those are the kind of things that are easy to build out of palm leaf plates or, or things like um, uh, bobbins or finger knitting out of just old bits of fabric that anybody can do on your five fingers. And you can build something that's then bold and you can stuff it and make it bolder or you could add fringe and things like using Nespresso pods and wax paper and make a statement. And that's just all around us. And it's just, you know, so much fun. Uh, You know, just shredded, um, shredded fabric. And and uh, plastic bags. This I made while I was in Greece because they have fabulous plastic bags of great colors, and they use this shredded cloth as a as a mopping, you know, dusting element. And you can buy it in bags. And I used to be able to get it, and then I didn't see it. So while I was there, of course, I had to stock up. That's on amazing! It. I can't yeah. wait. This is so cool. And so honestly, you're making. I mean. The way that you are, you present yourself is elegant and well put together and really um, curated. And when you pair that with the knowledge that these pieces are made like from a Brillo pad, from toilet paper rolls, it's just such a beautiful juxtaposition where really the sky is the limit. And really, if you want to feel elegant and you're, you have any financial limitation, you do not need to worry because you can, you know, use Deborah as like a role model to just re, re, like rethink how you yeah. are um, presenting yourself in the world. And it doesn't cost a lot of money. And it's just so it's so fun. Create your own personal image. And I believe frugality is fun because to just go out and buy garments like everybody else has to be trendy then you're going to look like everybody else. So frugality is fun. We have so much. I say curate your closet. We all have so much that if we just went through and started looking at it and saying, well, I could put that with that and wear it. And I also say, if you can't wear something upside down or backwards, it's not worth owning. You take a jacket, you turn it upside down, you turn it inside out, and it becomes a whole other form. Play with your clothes, you know, play with your food, play with your clothes. What do you have to lose? That's so awesome. Great, great, great advice. I love it. I have a couple kind of fun questions for you. Is your sister also very creative in the way she presents herself? She is, but she's a little more traditional. She's an interior designer and she studied weaving before me. So I followed her, but I went off in in a more uh, personal art direction and she went into the more commercial end and she uh, helped design and worked for a rug and, and, um, and carpet company for 49 years in the D&D building, which is the design and decorator building. And she loved it. And she's like my father. She could sell ice to the Eskimos. I can't close the deal. I'm more like my mother, creative, innovative, whatever. So as my sister, we, we really complement each other and we love each other's work and we help each other enormously. Oh, that's so lovely. How cool. And was your mother also an artist? Did she have art in her background? How did she, she, you know, being a a child of the depression? No, she, she didn't. But later on in life, she did take painting lessons and she loved to paint, but intuitively she had magnificent taste. And then, you know, that's why I said we would go antiquing and she sent us to art school and dancing school and all that stuff. Cause she knew, you know, and she even said, girls, Even if you don't get married, it's not the most important thing. Have a career. That's the most important thing. Take your creative juices and put it out there. And my my partner, who's a a songwriter and a wordsmith, says we're closest to the creator when we create because we come from that. That's where our soul and our spirit is. And that's what has to be expressed. It's that simple. Beautiful, beautiful, beautiful sacred gifts, right? Like we all have them and it's so lovely to see you have this 
amazing life of sharing those gifts and being such an inspiration to so many people. So Deborah, thank you so much. Like what a lovely exchange. I'm so glad that we've had this chance to um, connect. And again, I just want to encourage our listeners to go to those um, show notes pages at rags to riches, textile upcycling podcast Dot com and really take a look at what Deborah's sharing. You would, your, your first impression is not going to be um, Brillo pads and toilet paper rolls. I can <laughs> guarantee it. And um, Deborah, thank you again. What a pleasure. I have, I have one more quick quote that's Please, from my, share. From my yes. partner. It's, um, it's never too late if you haven't yet met your destiny. <sighs> Another good one. You're just like, this is awesome. Thank you so, so much. Um, yeah, my, my husband says it's never too late to have a happy childhood. Yeah, that's and, great. I love it. Yeah, it's so important to just remember that every choice that you, all day long, we're making choices. And we can yep. make choices that serve us, that allow us to have that um, freedom of expression and uh, creativity. And, you know, if we really just are mindful about that, we can walk toward yep. it every day. Right. Mindfulness and staying positive. You know, we've, we've got to put out positive vibes. That's the only way we're going to alter what's really happening. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you so much. Thank you. Hey, so I'm over here and I'm serving you a giant air hug because you just finished another episode of the Rags to Riches Textile Upcycling Podcast. Thank you for being with me. Our music is provided by The Lucky Five. Learn more about them at theluckyfive.com. Our show is produced and edited by Van Del Hyacin. If you want to dive in deep, head over to Rags to Riches Textile Upcycling Podcast.com. 